I go to prayer for half an hour at night. And I try to get as far away from everybody else as possible. Frankly, right? they don't need to be concerned with what I'm praying. That's none of their business. So I stayed in the back. And then someone took over my spot. I walked back and forth and they took over my spot. So what did I do? They had a stairwell going down to the front glass doors, walls on the side, and I went down there. No one ever went down there. So I prayed, and I prayed my little heart out day and night, but we went to prayer. I figured no one could hear me. I didn't want to be bothered. I found out after I was married that that little chamber just made an echo, and I was ten times louder than I was before. But I thought I had myself a prayer clock. But it is imperative that we do find our prayer closet. So go to that place where no one else can go and no one else can hear us. Because it is imperative for us to find ourselves just shut away with God. A place where we're shut away from the world, shut away from time, if, if possible, and just get focused on God. Why? Because we can get so deep in prayer that there comes a point that praying for several minute, uh, several hours to see like several minutes. There can be a point where the Shekinah comes down where all time just seems to disappear. To get lost in the presence of God in our secret place. That is where we're going to become powerful men and women with God because we found ourselves in places of prayer. And we don't go through when we pray vain repetitions. Because we're not hoping for a magical trick. We're not hoping to make God do something that uh, seems impossible. And the more I say it, the more it's going to happen. Just like when you go to work and you click your heels together three times, like there's no place like home, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. It doesn't work there. There's a difference between vain repetition, saying God save the soul over and over and over, versus God save the soul over and over and over. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying the same words over and over if it comes from our heart. If we're saying them over and over and over, trying to make God do something, well, then it's in vain. And who does such a thing? Who says vain prayers, repetitions, over and over and over? The heathen. The Word of God informs us that the heathen say their prayers and they repeat their words over and over and over, trying to provoke their gods to do something. We're not saying words over and over and over trying to provoke God to do something. We say them over and over and over because they mean something to us. Maybe we'll say our prayers over and over and over, or maybe we won't. But if we do, as long as they come from the heart, it doesn't matter. Jesus isn't talking about vain repetition as in, oh, that you mean it. It's something that's burdening you. Because if something's really burdening you, you're going to pray for it over and over and over. And possibly in the same time, is because that's going to be the focus of your prayer. But if it's in vain and you're just saying it to say it, then don't expect your answers to your prayers to be answered because that's what the heathen do. And when we look at the Greek word for vain repetitions, it's just babblings, speaking foolishness. Now our prayers with God shouldn't be foolishness. If they come from the heart. It doesn't matter what we say over and over. It's not foolishness. It's not babbling. Babbling is when you have nothing to say. Ever be, ever know anybody that likes to talk? And they just talk and they talk and they talk and they talk. And they don't shut up. Or maybe that he talk. You laugh, Brother Beaver. I used to work with a guy. And he'd tell you the same story over and over and over. And it's just because he liked to talk and gossip. But you hear the same thing over and over and over. You don't even hear it again. Why? Because I already know what Susie's doing. I don't even know it again. You might miss a certain detail. But when we pray and we have a burden, that's not what we're doing. It's not in vain. It's not bad. It means something to us. It burdens us. And because it concerns us and burdens us, it burdens Christ. It's not unnecessary. It's not vain. You know that for centuries, the Catholics and Protestants use prayer books during their services. When we look in Acts chapter 19, 24 through 34, we find the heathens worshiping their gods. 
And in 1 Kings chapter 18, 26, and 29, we find that he then using repetitions because they believe that it will increase their chances of being heard by their God. If I remember correctly, this is the account of Elijah on Mount Carmel. And there on Mount Carmel, what are the priests doing? They're trying to get the attention of their God. And they're praying, and they're praying, and they're praying, and they're cutting themselves, and they're doing everything they can. And what's Elijah doing? He's making fun of them for their vain babblings. And it gets to the point that he actually, if you study it out, he actually makes the comment that maybe your God's on the toilet somewhere and he can't hear you. But then, I think it was, it was with a 72 word prayer, Elijah calls fire from heaven. Well, you can say, well, he didn't repeat anything over and over. No. He didn't pray for hours and hours and hours. Not at that point in time. But for a man to get the ear of God like that, that man did spend hours and hours in prayer, I have no doubt. To get the ear of God to call out a fire like that. And we look at the Word of God, prayer is mighty for men and women who know what it is to have power with God. If we would look down and study the Word of God, the Bible doesn't say that God shut up heaven that it should bring, but Elijah shut up heaven that it should bring. If we sit down and study the Word of God and read it, God didn't command the sun to stand still. Joshua did. Well, where did Joshua get that power? Where did Elijah get that power? It wasn't from reading the Torah over and over and over. Joshua wasn't there in his tent reading the writings of Moses over and over and over. Elijah wasn't there reading the book of the Kings over and over and over. But they got power with God because of one reason. They prayed. And they didn't just pray, but they prayed. And they knew what it was to get in that secret place. And when the entire world was against them, they could not be intimidated. Why did Joshua command the sun to be still, stand still? So he could finish the work that God commanded him to do. God, if I'm going to finish this, sun, you need to stand there. Moon, you got to stand there. He didn't pray to God to have the sun stand still. He commanded the sun to stand still. That only comes when a man or woman is intimate with God and they get power with God. No man is greater than his prayer life. You realize that people fear those who know how to pray more than probably anyone else they really know? Unfortunately, we don't see, I couldn't tell you the last time I've seen it in our churches. But if you ever come into church afraid that there was sin in your life because God was going to reveal it to sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so because you know they you knew they talked to God? So you're coming to church getting making sure you're right before you get there because you don't want anybody else to know. Why was brother so-and-so, why would God tell brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, what's wrong in your life? Because they were close to God. They had the ear God because they knew what it was to pray. They knew what it was to agonize. And if we don't have those types of individuals in our church now, then maybe we need to be the individual who needs to step up and say, God, let me get close with you. Let me get intimate with you. Let me be the one who knows your secrets. In the Hebrides Revival, you had the pastor of the church there. You had the minister that came overseas to preach the revival. But you realize that both of those individuals, the minister, the preacher, they didn't know the secrets of God. But yet there was a little old woman in that church, if I remember correctly, she could barely see if she wasn't completely blind. But she knew the secrets of God. She said, brother, you need to go to this town today. He didn't know that. She knew that. And he went to, town, to that town that day and he 
people got saved, if I remember correctly, when he showed up, there were people at the constable's office because they were, he was the only one around that they knew was a God-fearing man. And they were trying to figure out how to get right with God. The evangelist didn't know it. The pastor didn't know it. But there was one little old woman who knew the secrets of God. Why did she know the secrets of God? Because she knew what it was to pray. A man or woman who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by man. Because as a Christian, people are already coming against us as it is. The person who knows how to pray will have a greater group of people coming against them. And if you think that you are off in your own little world, then count it an honor and a privilege, if that is the case, to be counted among the prophets. Because they were ridiculed, they were despised, they didn't have a group, a large band following. But they were not intimidated by man because they were intimate with God. Oh, to be men and women of God, that we are in such a place of prayer that man cannot intimidate us. Any thoughts, any questions? If not, then we'll stop here and we'll bow our heads and prepare our hearts. Gracious Heavenly Father, Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us. Shall continue to do, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below. That no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth. That the Holy Ghost may move, making himself visible if he so chooses. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord. Give them the songs you have us to sing as they praise you. Lead us in worship upon the prayers. As they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord. Knowing the pastor, his mind and his lips, as that your words will come forth as he preaches to us today, Lord. And may our minds and our hearts be, be prepared, that they be good soil for your word to follow, Lord. That we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we may apply to our lives. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, you